and welcome to the channel. Here, I share scareful stories. Stories to make you scared, make you think, make you wonder, and maybe, just maybe, make you a little more careful. If you like what you see, please give the video a like, leave a comment down below, and I'd love it if you subscribe to the channel. Today we're covering another Wisconsin case, and I credit this one as being my first real introduction to true crime. I was only 10 years old when all this happened, and in the 40 years after, I've learned that apparently lots of crazy stuff seems to happen in the land of beer and cheese. And talk about crazy. That's the word to describe the scareful story of Christine Schultz and Lori Bambi Bembenek. Little side note, normally the cases revolve around a victim and their story. This one is a little bit different because most of the focus will be on the convicted murderer, Lori, and if she was really guilty. But I also don't want to forget the victim in this scareful story, Christine. There's not much online about Christine Schultz, but what we do know is that she was born Christine Jean Pennings on November 15, 1950 in Michigan. She met Alfred Schultz in college and the two married, moved to Milwaukee, and Alfred, who liked to be called Fred, became a City of Milwaukee police officer. The couple had two sons together, Sean and Shannon, but over the years, their marriage began to deteriorate. Fred was very popular with the ladies, shall we say, and after her death, a friend would report to the police that Christine had been afraid of her husband and that there had been some violent episodes in their marriage. Christine and Fred divorced in 1980. Christine had custody of the boys, and Fred was ordered to pay child support as well as continuing to pay at least a portion of the mortgage on their home, which Christine continued to live in with Sean and and Shannon. On to Lori. Laurencia Ann Benbenek was born on August 15, 1958 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Her dad worked for a while as a police officer but quit when he said he became aware of corruption within the department. He then pursued a career as a carpenter. Laurencia, who went by Lori, graduated from high school in 1976 and then attended college in Virginia Beach, Virginia, graduating with an associate degree in fashion merchandising. After graduating, Lori worked in retail and also as a model. In a totally Milwaukee thing, she appeared in a Schlitz brewing calendar as Miss March. In 1980, she decided to follow in her father's footsteps and become a Milwaukee police officer. While training at the academy, she was given a nickname by some of the instructors and other recruits. Bambi. She really hated the name and found it offensive since it seemed to imply that she was just a pretty but airheaded blonde. Remember, this was 1980, so how women were treated in the workplace, especially in male-dominated careers like police work, was oftentimes pretty sexist and appalling by today's standards. While at the academy, Lori was accused of smoking pot. Lori thought that she had been accused by the wife of an officer who thought she was flirting with her husband. The accusation was investigated but ultimately did didn't go anywhere. By summer, Lori graduated from the academy and began working in the second district on the south side of the city. Her employment didn't last long though. Within a month, she was fired for having filed a false report in which she tried to protect some of her friends from being charged with possession of marijuana. After her termination, she went to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to complain about discrimination. Lori claimed that female and minority recruits were treated unfairly compared to white male recruits. She said that they were often fired during their probation periods for minor offenses that white males were not fired for. As an example, she provided pictures of male police officers dancing naked on picnic tables at a local park. This was a big party in the park with many police officers in attendance. Picnic tables were lined up to create a makeshift runway and both men and women participated in wet t-shirt contests and many of eventually completely stripping off all of their clothes and strutting naked down the tables. At some of these parties, children were in attendance and keep in mind that these parties were in a public park and that are open to everyone. Not just that, but there is a law against public nudity in Milwaukee, and so even off-duty cops are obligated to report crimes they see happening, and it should go without saying that they shouldn't also be the ones committing them. Lori saw these incidents as similar to that of seeing a friend smoking pot and being fired for trying to help her friend. None of those officers identified as having participated in the park parties had been disciplined, much less fired. The EEOC told her to take her claims to the Milwaukee Police Department's Internal Affairs Division. 
Eventually, Lori began working with the federal government in investigating police corruption. Needless to say, that didn't make her many friends on the police force. Needing a job, Lori worked for a time as a waitress at the Playboy Club in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. This often gets retold as Lori was a Playboy bunny, but she never was. At the same time, she began dating Fred Schultz. Interestingly, Fred was one of the naked men pictured at the park parties. Lori and Fred wasted very little time dating, marrying in January of 1981. And actually, they needed to waste a little bit of time as Wisconsin required Fred to wait at least six months after getting divorced before remarrying. There is some evidence that Fred lied on his marriage license in order for them to be able to get married. As a result, the couple's marriage was later ruled invalid and they remarried in November of 1981. Lori was working as a personal trainer and she and Fred lived with a friend, Judy Zess, who was the same friend Lori had tried to protect from being charged with smoking pot and that had gotten her fired from the police force. Eventually, Lori took a job working as a campus police officer for Marquette University in downtown Milwaukee. So I know what you're asking. Where is all this going? Well, here we go. On May 28, 1981, Fred's ex-wife Christine and their two sons were attacked in their home. 11-year-old Sean woke up when a masked man was either touching him or some reports say that the man was trying to put a rope around his neck. He began screaming and woke up his 8-year-old brother Shannon. The attacker went into Christine's bedroom and soon after Sean heard a loud bang and then the intruder fled. Sean found his mother gagged with a bandana and with her hands tied in front of her body with clothesline. She wasn't moving having been shot at point blank range in the back. The bullet went through her heart. Sean described the intruder as a man with broad shoulders, a long red ponytail, wearing a mask, a green top that was maybe a jogging suit, and with black shoes kind of like the ones police officers wear. More than Christine's death, which clearly was a horrendous crime, I'm terrified for those little boys. What was the plan there? To merely subdue them to make sure they didn't interfere with the crime? Or was it something worse? It just sends shivers through me. Fred had an alibi saying that he was on duty investigating a burglary with his partner Michael Durfee. Later, he would change his story to say that he was actually drinking in a bar at the time of the murder. But either way, he has other people that he was with that evening. Lori had no alibi as she was home alone sleeping at the time of the attack. She had spent spent part of the evening packing for a move to a new apartment. Twelve days after the murder, a neighbor of Lori and Fred had a clogged pipe, so they did what you do when you have a clogged pipe and they called a plumber. The plumber ended up pulling a red wig out of the pipe. Testing would show a match between the wig hair and fibers found on Christine. Fred's off-duty revolver had been retrieved from his apartment after Christine was murdered. The 38 caliber bullet found in Christine was tested and lo and behold, it appeared to have been fired from Fred's gun. Fred told everyone that the only people who had access to his off-duty weapon was himself and his wife Lori. Because Fred had an alibi, suspicion immediately fell on Lori, who had been home alone that night. Not only was she home alone that evening, but she also had access to the gun, as well as having a key to Christine's home. Whomever had killed Christine had not broken into the house, and they had also not stolen anything. It didn't seem so much to be a robbery gone wrong as a targeted murder. But who would want Christine dead? Police thought Lori did, and the motive was money. Fred was paying Christine's mortgage and also paying child support. With Christine out of the picture, those payments would stop. It didn't take long for police to arrest Lori. She was arrested at her public safety job at Marquette University on June 21st, 1981. She was charged with the murder of Christine Schultz. At the time she was arrested, her work locker was searched. In it was a hairbrush and investigators compared hairs from the brush to those found on the bandana used to gag Christine. Lori's trial began in March of 1982. Prosecutors called witnesses who testified that they had heard Lori complaining about the child support and mortgage payments. Other witnesses said they had seen Lori wearing a green tracksuit like Sean had described the intruder wearing. Sean, however, testified that it was not Lori who had killed his mother. Sean knew Lori and definitely said that it was a man, not a woman, and definitely not Lori who had killed his mother. There was a lot of press coverage of the trial. As if the whole new wife kills ex-wife plot wasn't enough, the press had a field day with Lori being young, pretty, and with a reputation of being a bit of an independent woman. She was often referred to as Bambi, the hated nickname she'd gotten while at the police academy. The jury deliberated for four days before finding her guilty of first-degree murder on March 9, 1982. She was sentenced to life in prison. And that's the story of 
No, wait, no, we're nowhere near the end of the story, but it is where I'll end this part. Stay tuned because there's a lot more coming up, including a daring escape from prison, multiple made-for-TV movies, and a growing movement to prove Lori innocent that continues to this day. Until next time, stay safe and stay careful.